students, uh, colleagues, friends, thank you for coming. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's uh, Peace and Conflict Studies event. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, the director of uh, ECON, Professor Andy Roth, for making this pop, uh, possible. Um, I would like to thank you also colleagues from uh, Political Science for their support and uh, administrator, uh, uh, Amanda Stewart, for everything she's done to set this event up. Um, well, it's a particular pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, David Dysonhouse, first of all because he comes uh, from my hometown, Johannesburg, and because he attended the uh, university where I spent most of my career, University of the Bacardus Um David went on from Blitz to Oxford where he did his doctorate. Uh, and from there he went to the University of Toronto where he's been in one or another capacity uh, ever since and where he's now Professor of Law and Philosophy, Albert Abel Chair and University Professor. Uh, growing up in apartheid South Africa, David came to focus early on the question of the relation between law and social and political justice and injustice. Uh, his first book, Hard Cases in Wicked Legal Systems, looked at the role of judges in South Africa. In 1992, he spent a year at the University of Heidelberg, which resulted in his uh, second <coughs> book, Legality and Legitimacy, Carl Schmidt, Hans Kelsen, and Hermann Heller in Weimar, examining the debates on law, state, and power in Germany during the years before the uh, Nazi seizure of power. He worked with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, and this produced his work, Judging the Judges, Judging Ourselves. Uh, his 2006 book, The Constitution of Law, dealt with the relations between the rule of law and the <coughs> security. David has received many others. Uh, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1999. He was the author of Goodhart, visiting professor of legal science at the University of Cambridge in 2015. And he was a fellow of the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin in uh, 2016 to 17. And at our present moment, I think there are very few questions as important as the relation between state power and the legal system. And therefore, David's topic tonight, rule of law under stress, is a particularly urgent one. Uh, welcome, David, uh, to Colgate, and we look forward to you. Thank you. Thank you. I should uh, warn you that uh, this is my second PowerPoint presentation, and uh, my PowerPoint seems to have disappeared already. <laughs> uh, there it is. So there might be more glitches than the one that you've just uh, seen. Let me see if I can get to the second slide. Right, this is my second slide. So I think you have gathered that the longer version of my title for today is Is the Rule of Law and a Special Stress in Your Country Because of the Actions of President Trump and His Administration? And uh, to my mind, the answer to that question is clearly yes. But you might wonder why I choose to illustrate uh, the point I want to make in this talk tonight by giving you a picture of Trump and the then nominee to the United States Supreme Court, uh, Neil Gorsuch. I don't know right now what Gorsuch is going to be like as a US Supreme Court uh, Justice, but I do have some worries in his regard, and I'm going to be talking about uh, those concerns tonight. But what I'm going to start with is uh, three areas of concern about uh, Trump in the rule of law. First, his uh, executive orders that uh, initiated travel bans. Secondly, his uh, pardon of Sheriff Marpeno. And uh, thirdly, his continual derogatory remarks about the judiciary. In Trump's worldview, I think these three elements form a kind of seamless whole. But the question for me tonight is whether there are any implications for our understanding of what Gorsuch might be like as a judge. So what I'm going to do is first of all set out the three issues. Then I'm going to uh, set out what I call a Gorsuch puzzle. And then I'm going to explain the puzzle in terms of analysis of the rule of law. So I want to go over the issues quite quickly because uh, I think you'll all know much more about him than I do. 
and I'll start with the uh, travel bans. As you'll know, version 1 banned all people with visas from seven Muslim majority countries from entering the US for 90 days. It also banned all refugees from entering the US for 120 days. And uh, it said that there would be, after the expiry of that ban, an exemption for uh, refugees who face religious persecution where their religion was a minority religion. Uh, and that clearly referred to uh, Christian minorities. As well, the order indefinitely banned refugees from Syria. Now, this order was successfully challenged in several courts. While the challenges were being mounted, Acting Attorney General Sally Yates directed the Department of Justice not to defend the order, explaining that she was not convinced that the order was lawful, and as all know, in response, Trump fired Yates. One of the successful challenges to this first order was heard by Judge James Robot of the U.S. Federal Court for the Western District of Washington. And uh, Trump uh, reacted, as you'll recall, as follows uh, to uh, Judge uh, Robot. And uh, you can read these uh, tweets at your leisure. I don't want to dignify them by reading them out myself. But you'll recall that these tweets also echoed uh, his remarks during a campaign about a federal district judge, Judge Gonzalo Puro, who was overseeing a lawsuit involving Trump University. Trump claimed that Puro was a hater, whose impartiality was in question because of his Hispanic and Mexican associations. After these successful challenges in court, Trump issued a second order which superseded the previous executive order and allowed for more exemptions. It eliminated Iraq from the original list of countries, the indefinite ban on Syrian refugees, and the exemption for religious minorities. It also did not apply to lawful permanent residents for those with a valid visa already in the US. However, two courts found this order discriminatory in part of Trump's uh, Islamophobic campaign statements. The matter then ended up in the Supreme Court, which stayed part of the temporary injunctions but allowed the executive order to remain substantially effective. The court also, the Supreme Court, granted a request for judicial review, setting oral arguments for last week, but that hearing was uh, not held, in part because Trump had in the meantime issued his third executive order. And as you'll know, this uh, third order bans indefinitely large groups of immigrants from eight countries, including this time uh, North Korea and Venezuela. But the effect is almost entirely on Muslim majority countries. Although North Korea and Venezuela are on the list, as you'll uh, realize, very few North Koreans ever get out of the country, and the ban on Venezuelans is limited to a few government officials. This ban has received less attention than the earlier version, but its effects are actually far worse. Unlike the earlier bans, this one is indefinite, and the order makes clear that the administration might add additional countries. Moreover, because it purports to target uh, North Korea and Venezuela, as well as Muslim-majority countries, and because it purports to be based on a review by federal agencies of security concerns, it is much more likely to survive uh, judicial scrutiny than the first two versions, which were widely perceived as the direct products of Steve Bannon's uh, nativist agenda. So that's the first element, a brief uh, overview of uh, the three executive orders uh, in regard to uh, immigrants and refugees. I move now to uh, the second issue, which, uh, which is the pardon of Sheriff Ophir. Ophir's pardon is hugely significant. In July, he had been convicted by one federal judge of willfully and intentionally violating an order by another federal judge in 2011, who had issued an injunction to stop unconstitutional police sweeps and detentions of people who looked Latino. Alpero had continued his practice in defiance of the order, and as a result, was found in civil contempt of court in 2016, and then in July of this year, he was found guilty of criminal contempt of court. And Trump's pardon arrived just in time to save him from being sentenced on uh, the conviction of uh, criminal contempt. In a blog post anticipating the pardon, Noah Feldman, a Harvard constitutional professor, commented as follows. He says that when a sheriff ignores the courts, he becomes a law unto himself. The court's only available recourse is to sanction the sheriff. If the president blocks the courts from making the sheriff follow the law, then the president is breaking the basic structure of the legal order. From this analysis, Feldman continues, it follows directly that pardoning of power would be a wrongful act under the Constitution. 
there would be no immediate co there would be no immediate constitutional crisis because legally speaking, Trump has the power to issue a pardon. But the pardon would trigger a different sort of crisis, a crisis in enforcement of the rule of law. And uh, keep in mind uh, my uh, calling earlier that uh, Trump had fired Gates as a result of Gates uh, not wanting to uh, contest the, uh, the first order before the courts. And it's also of a piece with his firing of James Comey. Now, what does this all have to do with uh, Gorsuch? So now I want to sit out through what I call uh, the Gorsuch puzzle. Now, I take as a given that Judge Gorsuch will comport himself in a way that he described the judicial office in a tribute to the late Antonin Scalia. So I don't want to impugn uh, his integrity as a judge. And I uh, particularly don't want to in any way try to suggest that he won't carry out what he calls uh, in the middle of that quote there, uh, the promise that all litigants, rich or poor, mighty or meek, will receive equal protection under the law and due process for their grievances. He continues, as you'll see, judges who assiduously seek to avoid the temptation to secure the results they prefer and do in fact regularly issue judgments with which they disagree as a matter of policy or because they think that's what the law fairly demands. So I, I take it for granted that Gorsuch is going to operate in exactly in accordance with this uh, statement that I just uh, put on uh, the board. And in addition, you'll recall, that when Gorsuch was still a nominee to the Supreme Court, he described Trump's tweets against Judge Roberts, the tweets I had up a moment ago, as demoralizing and disheartening. But it seems undoubtedly the case that Gorsuch is anti-executive in that he dislikes the executive branch of the state, perhaps in part for biographical reasons. It's well known that his mother, Anne Gorsuch Burfoot, a Reagan appointee, was the first woman to lead the Environmental Protection Agency. There she laid the basis for the present administration policy of appointing people to federal agencies in order to dismantle them. But she had to leave her position when Congress cited her for contempt for refusing to turn over documents relating to mismanagement of a toxic waste program. This episode is reported to have made a deep and negative impression on 15-year-old Neil Gorsuch. And I think it is relevant when it comes to explaining his skepticism about the Chevron Doctrine. This is the doctrine of American administrative law that requires judicial deference to the decisions of federal agencies on the ground both that uh, Congress has delegated authority to them and not to the judges, and on the basis that they have greater expertise than the judges when it comes to the nuts and bolts of how to implement their mandates. And now I'm going to uh, show you a uh, slide which contains a quote from a decision, uh, opinion of Gorsuch in 2016, where uh, he seems to express uh, rather uh, great hostility to the administrative state, saying it's time to rethink Chevron and the doctrine of deference that judges in the US have developed to the decisions of federal agencies and ends with the group that are to be involved. Maybe the time has come face the behemoth, the monster of the administrative state. So we do have, on the one hand, uh, Gorsuch's op opposition to the federal state in terms of this large bureaucracy that came into place after the New Deal in order to implement the policy mandates uh, of the federal agencies that were established. On the other hand, Gorsuch's record also shows a tendency to defer to the executive when it comes to national security and to immigration. And here, the next slide, is a passage from a memorandum he wrote while he was serving as a Deputy Associate uh, Attorney General under the Bush administration. And in this passage from the memorandum that he wrote, he makes it clear that uh, judges should not be making uh, the decisions when the issue is national security. And the reason that he offers is a reason at the end of the quote where he says that this is a role that the judiciary is institutionally unsuited to play. Now this is of course a passage from a memorandum written by a government letter, a government lawyer. It's not from the decision of a judge. And no one should underestimate the change in substance that occurs when someone steps from one official role to another. But it is also the case that it is fair to say that Judge Gorsuch's judicial record before his appointment to the Supreme Court exhibited a start of deference from the executive when it came to immigration decisions. Further, when the Supreme Court gave its decision on the second executive order, Justice Thomas, 
joined by Justices Alito and Gorsuch, wrote separately to say that they would have revived Trump's travel ban in the fall. So here we have what I called earlier uh, the Gorsuch puzzle. How can a judge be both pro and anti-executive? And I want to give you a provisional answer, which I think is the uh, real answer. I think Gorsuch is against the executive in the sense that he is opposed to what we can think of as the administrative state. The vast legal apparatus that I referred to a moment ago that was put into place after the New Deal. But he's in favor of the executive in that he thinks that only a strong state can preserve the identity of we the people. Protecting the people from being swamped by groups outside the state's borders to if allowed in would dilute and undermine the identity of we the people and from individuals who have come from such groups who have made their way into the borders and are alleged to pose a security threat to we the people. It's important, however, to notice that deference to the executive in both national security and immigration is hardly unique to Justice Gorsuch. Indeed, the decisions that followed the first two executive orders, even the Supreme Court's decision, which only uh, partially uh, upheld uh, the judges from the lower courts, went against the grain of uh, US constitutional law. For example, Justice Biden of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit quoted in his dissenting opinion the following two passages from a 1950 decision of the Supreme Court. So here we get uh, two passages from Health and Shaughnessy at 1950 decision of the US Supreme Court. And in this passage, the uh, Supreme Court starts with the proposition, the exclusion of aliens is a fundamental act of sovereignty. Whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or of any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may by proclamation, and for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants, or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he may deem to be appropriate. Notice that this, uh, this uh, decision not only regards the uh, president as having uh, a, this uh, rather grand authority when it comes to uh, aliens, but also seems to make the decision about whether uh, aliens should be permitted to enter the US or not rest entirely on the subjective say-so of the president. So I can't get a clear statement of this kind of view from the American Supreme Court. And if one looks through the jurisprudence on this matter, on which I should hasten to add, I'm no expert, one will find statement after statement going back uh, to the beginning of the last century and continuing uh, into the 1950s and beyond. So these courts that, as it were, but uh, the first two uh, executive orders that Trump made were going against the grain, against the precedent set by uh, the Constitutional Court and other courts in the USA. And here, uh, so the, this is quoted in Judge Bybee's uh, judgment, and here's a quote from Judge Bybee himself, where he says uh, that when it comes to uh, the kinds of matter that are at uh, uh, stake here, where the national security interests combined with uh, immigration, judges should not be tempted to balance those competing interests as we see fit. We cannot let our personal inclinations get ahead of important overarching principles about who gets to make decisions in our democracy. So the prevailing trend of this is in a descending uh, opinion is to say that when it comes to these matters of national security and immigration, it's the president who gets to decide. It's also worth noting, though, that uh, Justice Bybee ended his dissent by condemning the attacks on uh, his fellow judges, notably uh, the attacks that were emanating from uh, President Trump. And he says there, uh, such personal attacks treat the court as though it were merely a political forum in which bargaining, compromise, and even intimidation are acceptable principle. The courts of law must be more than that, or we are not governed by law at all. And those are the words that I really want to emphasize, not governed by law at all. I think it's easy to imagine uh, Justice Gorsuch penning exactly the kind of judgment of, from which I give you excerpts uh, from uh, Justice Bybee's judgment. That is a judgment which says, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's the case when it comes to national security and immigration, it's the president who gets to decide, but on the other hand, it is the job of judges to uphold the rule of law. 
So the, the next section of my paper, having set out uh, both uh, the three issues that, that I think give one concern when it comes to uh, Trump and the rule of law and setting out the forces puzzle, the next section of my paper is called uh, Governed by Law, and I take that uh, phrase from uh, Justice Biden's uh, judgment, his opinion in this matter. And uh, this part of my talk is, uh, I should uh, warn you, going to be rather uh, autobiographical. At least it's going to be about uh, my intellectual biography, uh, which uh, Jonathan has uh, already uh, charted for you. So the idea of what it is to be governed by law has been the focus of my academic work, as you learned in the introduction uh, to my talk. As a law student in apartheid South Africa, I was struck by the following fact. It was a system of parliamentary supremacy. There was no written constitution. The parliament could make any law that it pleased. That parliament, as you know, was in the grip of a white supremacist government, which also appointed the judges. Since the parliament enacted over the US statutes that both entrenched white supremacy and that gave the state vast powers to suppress political opposition, apartheid South Africa became known in legal philosophical debate as a main contemporary example of a wicked legal system, a legal order which is in all formal respects a perfectly functional legal order in which law is used systematically to implement injustice. What fascinated me as a student was that judges who were minded to do so could find within the law resources to resist the injustice that was perpetrated through law. As long as the government ruled by law, judges could find within the law such resources. And the next slide uh, shows uh, the cover of the uh, second edition of uh, one of my books, which Jonathan mentioned, uh, Hard Cases in Wicked Legal Systems. I, th I think this is a, a great photograph because it's a photograph of uh, one of South Africa's wicked laws. The white's only sign there is a, a sign about uh, the Group Areas Act. And the Group Areas Act uh, made it a criminal offense for a member of one racial group to live in an area that had been set aside for another racial group. And of course, as you would expect, uh, the officials who implemented the Group Areas Act implemented the act in such a way that uh, uh, most of the residential areas of South Africa, and especially the areas where it was nice to them, were set aside uh, for, for whites, thus making a criminal offence for members of other racial groups to live in those areas. So this was a statute of the South African Parliament. You recall there was uh, no written constitution. It was an independent judiciary, although all the judges were appointed by the government. And the only resources that judges had uh, were uh, the common law. And the only way that they could deploy these resources was not to challenge the validity of the law itself, but to challenge the implement implementation of the law by the state. And there the question would be the standard question of administrative law, did the official act within the limits of his authority? And the issue for South African judges was whether they would apply judicially developed principles of reasonableness and equality when it came to responding to challenges uh, to the implementation of the Group Areas Act. And uh, here's an excerpt from a case decided in 1961 by, uh, at that time, uh, South Africa's highest court, the Appellate Division. This case arose because Lockett, whose name appears in the second part of the style of the cause, an Indian, someone who came from, or family came from South Asia, argued that the effect of the division uh, of areas into areas set aside for one race, racial group was to discriminate to a substantial and therefore unreasonable degree against Indians, and such unreasonable discrimination had to be expressly authorized by the enabling legislation to be valid. So Lockett's claim was, if one looks at the text of the Rebarious Act, and he was right, there's nothing in that text that says that it, uh, the statute can be implemented in ways that discriminate against one group or treat groups as less than equal. And Lockett's argument was, well, if that's what the legislature wants to do, that's what it should say, uh, officials can't take it upon themselves to discriminate when the Act doesn't expressly authorize them to do so. This challenge was upheld in the lower courts but in the highest court, the uh, judges overturned the uh, lower court's decision. And uh, here's the central uh, quote from the judgment, where uh, the judges say, oh, this is a colossal social experiment. It's going to might result in all sorts of inequalities. But that's not an issue that uh, courts get involved in. 
the issue for the courts is the purely legal one, whether this piece of legislation impliedly authorizes towards the attainment of its goal the more immediate and foreseeable discriminatory results complained of in this case. In my view, the judge continues for the reason which I've given, it manifestly does. So the judge reads into the statute uh, the authority uh, to discriminate. But notice that the court could have held, as the lower court did, that until such time as Parliament expressly authorized unequal implementation, implementation had to respect the principle of equality. This would have been the principle of separate but equal, the principle upheld by the US Supreme Court in the late 19th century in Casey and Ferguson, projected in the 1950s in Brown and Board of Education. Whatever one makes of this principle, separate but equal, it would have been impossible to implement much of a part at all in accordance with it. But the basis for interpreting uh, the statute in this way came from the common law, from a common law principle that said that uh, officials, unless expressly authorized to do otherwise, had to uh, implement the uh, statute in a reasonable fashion, and in this case, reasonable meant not discriminating against a particular group. And common law principles can always be overridden by express uh, statutes, and the South African Parliament uh, usually reacted when judges gave such decisions by putting the wording into the statute that then expressly gave to the officials uh, the authority that the court had denied it. So this happened uh, in the, with the statutes that set up the system of white supremacy. It also happened uh, with the statutes that uh, suppressed political opposition. So this is an excerpt from Act 37 of 1963, uh, known as the 90 Days Act. Why? Because uh, it permitted the uh, police to uh, detain people for up to 90 days when they were suspected of uh, being in information, in possession of information relating to various offences. And to detain such people for interrogation until, in the opinion of the police, uh, that person had replied satisfactorily to all such questions. So that's the first part of. Uh, Act 37, you'll see that Section 17.2 says that no person must have access to the, the detainee except with the consent of the relevant minister. And Section 17.3, no court shall have jurisdiction to order the release from custody of any person so detained. The, the Act appears to be on its face rather limited. Uh, people can only be detained but for a very long time, uh, for 90 days. But uh, the courts held that uh, this 90-day period was renewable, and in any case, the statute was soon amended so that people could be indefinitely detained. We notice that there's a mix of objective and subjective factors. Right at the beginning, we get the idea of reasonable grounds, but later on, it's replaced by in his opinion. And as the uh, South African state refined its security apparatus, the grounds were made entirely subjective in the way that we saw that uh, the president's uh, power in regard to uh, national security and immigration was stated to be in the 1950s uh, US decision that I had up on the slide just a moment ago. And I want to highlight uh, two features of apartheid law in light of these two examples. The one of the Deep Areas Act, and then the one that's still up there, Act 37 of 1963, the 90 Days Act. So the first feature makes a jurisprudential or a legal philosophical point. With the Group Areas Act, as the statute uh, became more explicitly discriminatory, whether by legislative amendment or by judicial interpretation of the sort that we saw in Lockhart, it becomes unchallengeable on both formal and substantive grounds. That is, the express exclusion of common law principles, such as equality before the law, reasonableness, and so on, makes it seem futile to make use of the formal or procedural opportunity to contest a particular determination made by officials before a judge. Similarly, with the security statutes like the 90-day law, these not only excluded substantive principles, like the principle of habeas corpus, which is excluded in section 17.3, but even the formal procedural means of testing their observance. No court shall have jurisdiction. So one frequently gets in the security uh, statutes of the apartheid state what get called uh, technically primitive clauses clauses that say that no court shall have authority to pronounce on any decision made on, uh, in terms of the section 
by the Minister of Police or by one of the uh, police officers. And in both cases, both these cases, what one uh, arrives at is that those on the rough end of the law are put into a kind of lawless zone. They're no longer ruled by law, but by prerogative or arbitrary power. One has the appearance of government by law, but not its substance. The second feature I want to highlight is more political. The Group Areas Act was but was one of many laws that sought both to preserve white identity and to maintain the supremacy of the white, we the people of apartheid South Africa. The 90-day law and the other repressive laws of the security regime were about suppressing political opposition to that conflict of white supremacy. I think there's a necessary political link between these kinds of law. Where one has the first, one will also find the second. But I want to suggest now why the link is not only political, it is also jurisprudential. So this gets to the second stage in my uh, intellectual uh, autobiography. So my next major project, as again uh, Jonathan mentioned, was on bimoral legal theory. As in this area, just before the Nazi seizure of power in 1933, some of the great legal scholars of the 20th century were locked in debate about the state, the rule of law, the nature of constitutionalism, the role of judges in preserving the constitutional state, and so on. And out of that work uh, came a book, A Legality and Legitimacy, Carl Schmidt, Hans Kelsen, and Herman Heller in Weimar. Of these three figures, only Carl Schmidt is well known these days. But it's worth remarking that, that at the time I started to work on him, only a very few scholars writing in English knew much about Schmidt. Whereas these days, he seems almost as well known in departments of political science and international relations, as well as to constitutional law scholars, as, say, uh, the great American political philosopher, uh, John Rawls. And here are some of the uh, best known lines from uh, Schmidt's work. From his work of 1922, Political Theology, uh, Sovereign is he who decides on the exception. That's the first line of the book. From his work of 1932, just before the Nazi seizure of power, the concept of the political, again the first line of the book, the concept of the state presupposes the concept of the political, and then later on in the concept of the political, Schmidt claims that the specific political distinction is between friend and enemy. In Schmidt's work, these points get linked in the following way. The state of exception, referred to uh, in the first uh, excerpt, is a situation in which ordinary legal rules run out and government by law is no longer effective. In that moment, the moment when ordinary legal rules run out, the only institution such a claim capable of acting efficiently is the executive. So the executive proves to be sovereign and the true guardian of the constitution. Successful action by the executive will be action that makes the distinction which he refers to in the last excerpt between friend and enemy. And it does so by preserving the substantive homogeneity, again a term from Schmidt, of the political community. The substantive homogeneity of we the people. So that's uh, Schmidt's theory in a nutshell. I think it's significant that Schmidt's journey uh, from being an obscure Weimar thinker at the time when I started working on him in the 1990s to a frequent reference point <coughs> not only in academe, but also in the media, happened after 9-11. And it so happened that when I uh, started uh, doing some of the work towards preparing the talk tonight, I just Googled uh, Schmidt and Trump and came up immediately with an op-ed in uh, the New York Times, which uh, went uh, through uh, uh, a series of comparison between uh, Trump's worldview and uh, Schmidt's, something that was unthinkable uh, many years ago. So uh, Schmidt's journey began uh, to, across the Atlantic, began after 9-11, which was a moment of existential crisis for this country. And, th and he is likely to become even more central to political debate because of the way in which uh, Trump continually evokes the idea of crisis, as well as invoking his own unique abilities as a great leader to respond to crises as he deems fit, though in a way that attracts the acclaim of his base which uh, Trump quite unabashedly equates with we the people. I think that one finds a real echo of Schmidt uh, in uh, Trump's worldview. 
But for the moment, I want to focus on uh, this link that I claim that one can learn between uh, political identity and uh, the rule of law, because it is Schmidt's theory that provides a legal link between the substantive idea of the political community and the idea that the executive must have a free hand to protect it. And I want to illustrate this substantive link not by referring to Schmidt, but by referring to a short article by one of his disciples, a man called Ernst Horstel, uh, who published the, uh, a piece in a symposium in a Nazi law journal in 1934 on formalism in law. And it's in this uh, symposium on formalism in law, uh, Horstel's contribution was uh, called Formalism in Public Law. Formalism, by the way, became, after the Second World War, uh, one of uh, uh, Germany's most prominent uh, public lawyers. Horstel, in this 1934 piece, argues uh, that the, uh, the triumph of what he calls formalism in public law, specifically the idea that to become a citizen one has only to meet certain formal, not substantive qualifications, was a great political victory for the Jews in the 19th century. This uh, formal understanding of citizenship, like the more abstract idea of formal equality, Horstel argues, made it publicly impossible to make any distinction between Jews and Germans and thus made it possible for Jewry to emerge as members with equal rights to the German folk or people. Thus was destroyed, Forstop says, the nationalist basis of any community order. The political efficacy of formalism, Forstop claims, resides in its renunciation of any distinction between Jew and German. I think if one takes these ideas from 1934, one just needs to substitute Muslim for Jew and to think back on Trump's railings against the judges who stood in the way of his, his executive orders, to see that these ideas are now not so strange to the American political scene. But my point isn't to claim that Trump, that Trump is a Nazi. Rather, it is to expose a structure of a kind of anti-legal political thought that, once exposed, tells us something about the structure of legal thought. And that establishes uh, the link I claimed earlier between a substantive conception of we the people and political expression. The link is established negatively through seeing what happens when law is used as a tool to bring about or to maintain such a substantive conception of we the people. The link is between an understanding of the legal subject, the individual subject to the law, as formally equal before the law, and the protections that we associate with the idea of the rule of law. To be governed by law is to be governed in accordance with these protections. Now, my next slide is from a uh, 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 very exceptional book by a German political scientist and uh, lawyer who uh, came to the United States uh, in the late 1930s because he was probably a socialist and a Jew, had to get out of Germany. He'd written a book called The Dual State in the uh, late 1930s in Germany, and he then translated that book uh, in 1941, which was published by Princeton as The Dual State. It's now been reissued by Oxford University Press. And what Frankl argues in his book, The Dual State, is that in order to understand the Nazi state, we have to understand it as a dual state. What is the dual state? Well, on the one hand, that's what's called the normal state. That's whatever remained of the law and institutions of the Bible legal order. And that existed side by side with what uh, Frankl called the prerogative state, which consisted of uh, the apparatus of the Nazi party, and within that apparatus, the leader's will was the ultimate source of authority. And Frankl points out in his book that there was, as a result, no rule of law in Nazi Germany, because the law of the normative state governed only as long as officials in the prerogative state did not find such government inconvenient. So as soon as uh, an official found that some rule of the normative state got in the way of what the official thought served the interests of the Nazi party, the official could have that rule uh, put aside. The rule of law, of course, still prevails in the United States. But the worry we saw Feldman express earlier about our fair's pardon is precisely the worry about the intrusion of the prerogative state into your national life. Moreover, prerogative rules in areas like uh, immigration or national security. But its rule is disguised by what a British judge memorably called a thin veneer of legality over the reality of executive decision-making, untrammeled by any prospect of effective uh, judicial supervision. Now the problem here arises using uh, vocabulary that I've developed in my work on uh, national security and states of emergency because of what I've called uh, the compulsion of legality. 
What is the compulsion of legality? It is a requirement in states governed by law that when public officials act in a way that affect individuals' rights and interests, that they be able to show a legal warrant and authorization in pre-existing law for their acts. But as I've explained in my work, the compulsion of legality can set in uh, motion two very different cycles of legality. In one virtuous cycle, the institutions of legal order cooperate in devising controls on public actors that ensure that their decisions comply with the principle of legality understood as a substantive conception of the rule of law. In the other empty cycle, the content of legality is understood in an ever more formal or vacuous manner, resulting in the mere appearance or even the pretense of legality. And what is shocking about Trump's pardon of Arpeo is it then that it raises the prospect of a president who is ready to do without even the pretense of legality. The former Feldman said, Arpeo had, as a result of the pardon, become a law unto himself, and, he, and uh, Feldman said this was a crisis in the enforcement of the rule of law. Now, it's probably the case that Gorsuch is both troubled by this pardon. But I do not think that it's irrelevant to note that he interrupted his career as a lawyer to write a doctorate in Oxford under the supervision of John Finnis, the leading natural lawyer of the last uh, 70 or 80 years, in which uh, Gorsuch argued on both moral and legal grounds against what in Canada we call physician assisted death. So he took time off to uh, write uh, this uh, PhD in Oxford against physician assisted death, which was later published uh, by Princeton. And uh, just focusing on his uh, supervisor, uh, John Finnis, for the moment, here is a uh, quote from a 2009 paper by Finnis, which I find uh, really uh, quite extraordinary, that a, a professor of uh, legal philosophy in Oxford uh, could write such a thing, and uh, hardly anyone would notice that he'd written such a thing. So Finnis talking about uh, decisions of uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights, uh, it says that uh, the European Court of Human Rights has been warning of, uh, that there are problems to do with uh, Muslim populations of Europe, and he describes these problems, as you'll see on the slide, as follows. Citizens of countries whose Muslim population is increasing very rapidly by immigration and a relatively high birth rate may ask themselves whether it is prudent or just for the children and grandchildren of everyone in their country to permit any further migratory increase in that population, or even to accept the presence of immigrant non-citizen Muslims without deliberating <coughs> seriously about a possible reversal humane and financially compensated for the enterprise of the inflow. Now, a possible reverse inflow is, of course, just a double speak uh, for ethnic cleansing. And it, uh, in addition, Phyllis has led the way more recently in UK debates about the legal framework for Brexit in arguing that the executive and not parliament is the guardian of the constitution when it comes to the existential decision to restore the sovereignty of the British people by exiting from the British community. So these arguments are that uh, the executive is the true guardian of the constitution. So we have, one gets here the two elements, this idea of the executive being the true guardian of the constitution and then the, the uh, claim about the substantive homogeneity of the people, uh, which is to be guarded, first of all, by not letting the wrong sorts in, but also by trying to ensure that the wrong sorts who are already in are, uh, are uh, uh, maybe incentivized uh, to exit. Now, one has to be more than a little careful uh, when it comes to foisting the views of a doctoral supervisor on a former student. And I confess that I was to my great profit supervised by the same man, by John Finnis, uh, during my time as a doctoral student in, in Oxford. But I do think that the package of views that Finnis uh, holds offers a solution to the Gorsuch puzzle. How the same jurist can be both for and against the executive, against when it comes to the administrative state, but for when it comes to preserving the identity of we the people. That is the provisional conclusion that I stated earlier has something going for it. Gorsuch, I think, is against the administrative state, but he's in favor of the executive, and that he thinks that only a strong state can preserve the identity of we the people, protecting them from being swamped by groups of the other. I want, however, to uh, close on a somewhat optimistic note, although this optimistic note begins with another dash of pessimism. 
so the pessimism is that we have to keep in mind if one thinks, as I, I clearly think, that there's a serious problem uh, posed for the, the rule of law in the U.S. by Trump, and that uh, the appointment of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court uh, should make us rather more worried that, uh, about the uh, rule of law. The extra-national pessimism is that uh, the problem is far bigger than Trump and Gorsuch. As I've suggested already, Obama and other presidents and their administrations have for generations been perfectly content to have decisions about immigration and national security made in a way that is not in substance governed by law. However, the sad tale which I've related to you today, and uh, which you're much more familiar with than I am, uh, has, I think, the following perhaps uh, pessimistic uh, spin that one can put on it. Trump's orders, his executive orders, as well as his uh, pardon of the of power, etc., etc., have drawn attention to these blocks on the U.S. legal landscape and have provoked, at least with the first two orders, although it remains to be seen with the third, a judicial response which goes against the trend of U.S. law. Moreover, that judicial response was not only to Trump, but also to thousands of U.S. citizens who protested at airports and other venues against the orders. So the hope is that the we the people of the U.S. will turn out to be those who make up Trump, who turn out to be those not who make up Trump's diehard base, but the people that the great U.S. judge Leonard Hand had in mind in a famous passage from a speech in 1944 in Central Park, New York City, to celebrate a day called I Am an American Day. So here is uh, the quotation from uh, Leonard Hand, where he said, What do we mean when we say that first of all we seek liberty? I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes, believe me. These are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no court, no law, no court can even do much to help it. Where it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. Now, I do think that when those uh, thousands of people went to the U.S. airports, uh, they did something that showed that when uh, the love of liberty uh, lies in the heart of uh, the citizens of a country, that is ultimately a bulwark against uh, oppression. And uh, nothing else can actually save a country uh, from oppression other than uh, this commitment by uh, the, uh, the citizens of that country and by others subject to the law, uh, to the ideals of uh, liberty, equality, and the rule of law. But I do want to suggest that uh, perhaps uh, there is something that one needs to add to uh, Leonard Kahn's uh, uh, claims in this uh, paragraph that is one of the relief to the last slide that I'm going to click on you tonight. And, and, and this is an idea that came out of uh, 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 the book I, I wrote called uh, The Constitution of uh, law, law, Legality in a Time of Emergency in uh, the uh, late uh, 90s, I think it was. And, and, and there I came up with an idea of uh, the judge as uh, a weatherman. Now, in, in those days, uh, you could rely on uh, students uh, remembering uh, who Bob uh, Dylan is. I'm not sure whether this is still the case uh, today. But Bob Dylan had this uh, famous uh, song which had, had a line that uh, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And I think this was a direct uh, reference to uh, student activism in, in the 1960s. But I do think, uh, contrary to Bob Dylan, I don't often have thoughts contrary to him, but I do in this case, uh, that one does need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And I think that the most important role for uh, judges and lawyers, like the ACLU in this country, is in uh, issuing uh, weather reports telling people when there is a real problem for constitutionalism, for the rule of law, and so on in this country, so that people themselves can decide whether they want to stand up uh, for those values. So ultimately, if you're worried, as I'm worried from across the border, about what's happening in your country, I think the message of my lecture is if you care about the rule of law, then it's up to you uh, to save it. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh, um, I don't know where to start here. I, um, 
I work in Russia, and lately I've been traveling around giving talks to small community groups about um, Russia Trump connection. And at the end, there are always 50 or 60 people there, mostly mostly hippie, old hippies, um, over 60 or 70. But at the end of every talk I give, they ask, what can we do? And as an academic, I have almost no clue, right? I can only offer a kind of academic wisdom. Um, and what I say to them, not really being that savvy about law, is something like this, that there is there is some kind of protection offered, uh, that, that's the only kind of protection that we have right now, is offered by that spirit that people are showing when they show up on the street. Um, but that it has the law at the center of it. And this is exactly what Learning Hand seems to, this is what it seems to be saying. But the question from for me, and I, I, I think about this all the time, is what is that thing? Huh. You know, in, in this quote, it's liberty. What is that thing that lies in the hearts of those who show up at, at the airports? What, what exactly is that, that thing we carry around that seems to have something to do with the rule of law that drives people to protest when our pio is part? And conversely, what is that thing that we see in Donald Trump's face when he defies the rule of law? Which is a kind of, you know, it's an aesthetic, sadistic, aesthetic expression of pleasure at his power to do something to that thing that I don't know the name of. Does, does, that, does that make sense? That, there's a, that there is an aesthetic communicative, discursive point and counterpoint that has the law at the center of it. And what is it? I, I think there is uh, something important in this idea of uh, yes, yeah, Because if I go back and uh, looks at uh, Paul Schmidt, <coughs> German jurist and political theorist I referred to uh, earlier. Schmidt had the idea that uh, the sovereign will like articulate a vision for uh, of who the people is, and, and then the significant group within the nation state will uh, greet that, that vision with some kind of a thing, the yard of the people, and that, that forms a point between the uh, ruler and uh, this group, which can, then forms the basis of uh, a state. Uh, be a state that uh, succeeds in making this uh, existential distinction between friend and enemy. And, and there's nothing more to it than this moment when people kind of recognize uh, uh, themselves in the vision articulated by the leader. So it's, it's, it's not a, uh, it's something that transcends our ordinary understandings of politics and law. And, and one way to describe what's going on in this moment is that, that, that there's something that's aesthetic going on there or you could call it existential, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I, I think that has some kind of resonances in the way that uh, politics are being played out uh, in this country at the moment. I read recently that uh, one of Trump's uh, billionaire backers has uh, recently rebuked him for uh, thinking that his base remains this group of people who applaud everything he does because this billionaire, whatever his name is, said uh, Trump has to realize that his base is not only now uh, that place, but also people in general in the U.S., but also people beyond uh, the borders of the U.S. The President of the United States, your base is not this group who uh, is willing to acclaim you whenever you uh, uh, say something that uh, appeals to them. And uh, the, the rule of law gets in the way of uh, that kind of leader. Right? We, and, and, and this was the hope that was uh, uh, expressed by Obama uh, immediately after uh, it became clear that Trump was going to be your next president. He said, the office our president is bigger than the person uh, who inhabits that office. And both he and Hillary Clinton, when they were willing at that early stage to say, say, indicate what they thought was worrying about Trump, uh, indicated that what they thought was most worried was whether he would abide by the rule of law. 
I didn't uh, elaborate why this was a worry, but I think the worry is that uh, a, a leader in a, a modern democracy is someone we think of as uh, not having a personality uh, that is supposed to transcend the office in such a way that that person can just make uh, decisions at will. So everything gets based on that person's objective say so. Those decisions have to be filtered uh, through the legal order. And that we filtered through the legal order in such a way that when uh, an official at the lower level of the legal order, say a passport official at uh, one of your airports, decides whether this person is going to be allowed into uh, the country or not, that person has to make a decision that can display a legal warrant for uh, the decision, a basis in existing law. Not that uh, you can, uh, we, we can do what we like because our president uh, can do what he likes and he's told us that we should act in this way. Now the difference, I think, between the United States and uh, a country like uh, Russia and, uh, or China, which I was thinking of talking about to, tonight, but I didn't have the time, is, is vast. Why? Because uh, in Russia or China, insofar as I know anything about those countries, while there might be lots of people who have uh, this uh, ephemeral stuff in their hearts that they're in the tank of, they don't have the institutional apparatus to back that up. Whereas in Canada, at eh, least Canada, sorry, my, my country, <laughs> the USA, uh, but it's true of both countries, they're huge, uh, they're huge apparatuses that are very difficult to dismantle, that are already in place, that can be relied on in order to try to uh, uh, bring uh, executive power uh, to account. So it's not that the rule of law has uh, disappeared, was likely to disappear at any time soon in this country. It's just that it is under a real threat. And uh, the, the, the signs of that threat are, uh, are, are palpable. But the, the pardoning of, of uh, Sheriff Arpeo is uh, really, uh, I think, hugely significant for, for the rule of law in this country. It says that someone who had conducted himself in a clearly racist and discriminatory way against US constitutional values is not only uh, not subject to the law, but when he uh, defies federal judges, uh, will be exempt from uh, legal process uh, by the president. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's actually hard for to, to imagine a president doing something like that. Neither. Okay. Thank um, I have a question about your idea of the compulsion of legality and specifically kind of the idea of like legal precedent. I don't have a lot of knowledge of the U.S. legal system, but from what I understand, it seems like a lot of our court systems are based on really upholding this idea of legal precedent. Like you mentioned, someone referencing back to a 1950 um, law, and I guess I'm wondering at what point does that basis on legal precedent deviate from the upholding law and turn into this kind of like a halting of progress. Is there a point at which law past legal um, mandates kind of expire and we need to stop relying on a legal precedent and instead, I don't know, create some sort of new way to adapt to our social circumstances? Well, I, the, the, the problem with uh, the precedent when it comes to immigration law and national security law in the United States, is that if the courts continue to follow precedent, they'll continue to find that uh, the president has this virtually unlimited authority to exclude aliens as he sees fit and to deal with uh, national security as he sees fit. So the precedent is bad. And so in, a way, in order for there to be uh, a, a good uh, jurisprudential basis for uh, in these areas of law, judges would actually have to start to depart uh, from uh, precedent. And then that in itself is a kind of rule of law problem when judges start to depart uh, from precedent. So it starts to get a kind of conflict within, uh, the, uh, within the rule of law because it's pulled in both directions. Judges should abide by precedent. But what if the precedent actually undermines the rule of law then they should depart from precedent? So that's a, a difficult uh, thing for judges uh, to deal with. But, but I think the important point to focus on, which I try to uh, present in my lecture, and which I, I think your question also raised, is that uh, the law can be used in order in a way that uh, hollows out this claim that people are governed by law. 
So if, 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 if I, I'm the, uh, the lawmaker, and you, you're the official who's going to implement the law, and I uh, enact a law that says uh, you may detain people as you see fit until they've answered uh, questions uh, to your satisfaction, I've made you what uh, Feldman called in a uh, uh, set of uh, worries about Sheriff of Health, a law unto yourself. This is a, a kind of old phrase in, uh, in the law. You yourself decide on your say so what the law is. So even though I have formally speaking delegated you that authority using the steps that uh, uh, have to be taken in order for me to enact a valid statute, I've nevertheless given you uh, uh, an authority which is legally un unlimited. And there are all sorts of ways that uh, legislatures can do this. Another way is the way that I, I mentioned briefly uh, earlier when I had the 90-day uh, law up on a slide, which is to say that uh, the, the official decisions about, say, who to detain under statute may not be reviewed by any court of law. So you make what the officials do unreviewable, so there's no independent institution that can check whether the uh, officials were acting according to law. And, and so this idea of the compulsion of legality is that these days uh, one will find it it's very unusual to find a, a state in a country with, with, with which most of us are familiar where there isn't this compulsion of legality. There always will be legal authorization, but legal authorization could be authorization of a kind which in, in effect gives officials uh, the, uh, the authority to do as they want. And, and uh, then we have something like the prerogative state uh, disguised by this uh, thin veneer of uh, legality. The special problem, I think, with Trump's pardon of our power, as Feldman pointed out, is that it, it's just that, that uh, formally speaking, the president has the power to pardon. But let's look at the substance of what he did. He said that this official is above the law. So uh, somehow using law to put someone uh, beyond uh, law's control. And then the problem with immigration and security law is that it's been doing that for a long, long time. And that quote on the slide wasn't from a, a, a statute, a piece of legislation. It was from a Supreme Court judgment. Right? These are the judges saying that the president has this kind of authority. I was wondering if you've been talking primarily about the courts, these episodes and the people. Um, there are two things I'd be interested to know more about. One is um, you, you seem quite optimistic about the role of the people, but given our kind of media environment where the information people are accessing is just completely contradictory. And so this idea that we do all kind of potentially have this thing inside us it's not going to get triggered in certain categories of people in the same way. Not everybody is going to be reading what the ACLU has to say. I also wondered um, what role you might see for Congress in maybe pushing back about some executive overreach and perhaps um, rebalancing using um, its powers to kind of check the executive. Maybe is that also something that we might see happening I, I don't know enough about uh, the details of what happens politically in this country to make uh, predictions about what Congress uh, might or might uh, not uh, do. But uh, to continue in the pessimistic vein for uh, just a moment, the, the, the worry with the third executive order uh, is twofold. And I only spoke about uh, one of the issues. So the issue I spoke about is that this third executive order on its face looks better than the first two. Why? Because uh, for two reasons. Uh, it uh, adds non-Muslim majority countries to the list, even though that looks completely specious, right? North Korea and some officials from Venezuela are added to the list of Muslim majority uh, countries. And then the second reason is that uh, the first two executive orders were uh, really kind of cursory. And they sounded like Bannon's speak. So people thought, well, this is just Steve Bannon exerting his power in uh, the, the White House administration. Whereas this third order is much more uh, legalistic in, its, uh, in, 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 the, in the way that it's uh, uh, expressed. And what's more, it says uh, 
the relevant federal agencies have done a review of all of these countries, determined that they pose a security risk, and that's why they're on the list. So it doesn't come out of nowhere, right? So it, it look, looks facially better, and it looks uh, like something that is now being backed by real deliberation, not just in the, in the White House, but within federal expert agencies. So for that reason, it's uh, much more likely to survive uh, judicial scrutiny. But the second reason I think is uh, more troubling, the second reason is uh, both of the, I think the courts are probably by now tired of standing up to Trump. And uh, they also think that they won a significant victory the first time around. Even the Supreme Court, to some extent, agreed with the, the, the lower courts. And uh, they, they just might want to continue the fight. But I think it's highly significant that they uh, back the trend of US law in the, in the first and the second order. Are they going to do that in the third order? Uh, uh, no, they might just not be willing to go out further on uh, this, this branch. And they might also just be tired of the fight. And this issue of tiredness then ties into a third worry, and that is that people are tired. Are people going to go to the airports now uh, for a, a, a third uh, set of protests? It's not clear that that has happened or that it is going to happen. So there might be a kind of inertia uh, that's set in. So that's, none of that is really uh, grounds for uh, optimism. But there are also signs, and I'll venture into this uh, area where uh, you know much more than I do, because you live on this side of the border, and that is there are signs <coughs> that uh, as senior Republicans who could hardly be said to be men of the left are getting worried about uh, the extreme that uh, things are being taken to in this country. And when that happens, and I believe that most of them probably are committed to the rule of law in the same way that I think that Gorsuch is committed to the rule of law, I think he probably has a wrong conception of the rule of law, there will come a time when I think uh, people say enough is enough. And uh, maybe that will come from uh, the Republican members of Congress, I, I just don't know. Would you personally find that the executive orders enacted by Trump and the pardoning of Sherman to be the most troubling and uh, troubling incidents, most subversive for the rule of law the United States at this time? I don't know. Maybe you have examples that are uh, much worse than this uh, doom and gloom that I've tried to spread around the room. Not quite. I was just wondering. <laughs> Sure. You briefly mentioned uh, some international implications. I just wanted to see if you had more to say about that, because given that he is the President of the United States, and whether it's a fair conception or not, you know, it's the idea of the leader of the free world that the United States sets precedence on an international stage. Are there other leaders that you've identified throughout the world, or other governments, or is there a possibility that others will, others will see him doing it, and then, you know, uh, antagonizing against the rule of law, and that they'll start following his suit? Well, the there is that worry. So I, I do think that, uh, for example, uh, Orban in Hungary or the present regime in Poland uh, take a great deal apart from what's happening in, uh, in uh, your country. And that, I think uh, uh, Vladimir Putin is probably pleased by it as well because uh, you know, he's not really into the rule of law, one might say, but he's quite happy when he has a thoroughly uh, power in the United States is also not into the rule of law. Why? Because uh, the United States of America does like to portray itself as this kind of example for the rest of the world. And if the example no longer seems to be the example of a rule of law upholding our uh, country, then that is of comfort to uh, uh, lead us uh, elsewhere. So, but, but I want to add a kind of footnote uh, onto this. And, and so, so there is, and this might be largely the product of someone who uh, doesn't come from this country, but I find rather disturbing this idea that the US is this example to the rest of the, the world. It seems to me that it's a, 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 a caught out a kind of uh, American exceptionalism that, that I find troubling. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, President Obama was actually just as guilty of this as uh, any American president. This idea of uh, it's the shining whatever on the hill and uh, America's manifest destiny projecting its values to the rest of the world. Uh, I think that's problematic. And then when uh, America changes course and the wrong values are projected, what is the rest of the world supposed to uh, follow suit? I, I th per perhaps uh, what one's getting now is some kind of pushback from countries uh, in 
uh, Europe, and elsewhere, not in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but elsewhere in Europe, where uh, they're saying, these are not America's values, these are values that bind us all, and America is now departing from these values, and I think that's uh, a problem. Um, yes, uh, actually, I'm kind of uh, really interested that you mentioned and then you brought up um, Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown v. Board of Education, um, mostly from this idea of judicial precedent and this body of law that's been built up on something that we can consider a bad precedent. Um, so I guess my, my question would be, <coughs> we're going on this idea that, this, uh, that the deference that the judicial branch gives the executive branch uh, in terms of national security and immigration is bad precedent. Would it require kind of a Brown Board of Education decision from the court um, in order to kind of reverse that? But then, I guess, to put back on that um, in my own kind of head, um, is that we've also had a problem in this country that the court will say something, but what the president's doing is wrong, and the president has ignored it. In fact, I can think of several instances, one of them being the Cherokee Indian removal from the state of Georgia um, and the tra Trail of Tears. Um, I guess if the court was to kind of issue this Brown v. Board of Education like decision to reverse this bad precedent, and then the president, maybe it's this one, maybe it's the next one, were to ignore that, what would, should be, what could be said about the rule of law then? Very sad things. <laughs> but, 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 I'm not an expert on your country's law, and I'm not an expert on constitutional law, but as I read these uh, lower court decisions, that responded to the first and the second uh, executive order. But they weren't, they didn't purport to be on the scale of Brown and the Board of Education, right? They, they said, on ordinary constitutional law grounds and other grounds, we find that these orders uh, can't be uh, upheld. But just Judge Bybee, in his dissenting opinion, accused his other judges, his fellow judges, of, of uh, disguising the fact that what they were doing was uh, kind of Brown v. Board of Education uh, scale decision, departing so dramatically from uh, past precedent that they had, in fact, uh, overturned uh, many, many years of uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, precedent. But, that, but that there was nothing grand about these judgments. They were just using really quite ordinary tools, even if one thinks, as Judge Despiby did, that uh, they were... Uh, uh, doing one thing uh, which on the surface seemed quite ordinary, but actually concealed a, a much uh, more foundational change that they were trying to bring about in American uh, constitutional law. So I'm, I'm not sure that we need a, 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 a new Brown new Board of Education in the US in order to uh, go against the trend of uh, past precedent. What one needs is just ordinary tools that judges are very adept at of distinguishing and uh, and uh, uh, past cases, uh, finding that the facts of, of the case before them are not facts that have occurred before, and uh, one can do without these grand moments and still uh, chart a very new course in, uh, in the law. In regard to the second issue that you bring up, if, uh, say, the Supreme Court did uh, declare that uh, the uh, uh, third order was uh, unconstitutional and therefore uh, invalid. And uh, Trump and his administration just defied that court order. Well, you know, that, that would be a much more serious crisis than the crisis that I, I think uh, some people think was provoked by the pardon of Sheriff Parker. But it has happened before in your country's history, and maybe it will happen again. Can I ask one thing, which is really a kind of sociological question about judges and what you may have been <coughs> learned from studying judges for, for a long time. Um, do you think that um, judges by and large simply carry out the agendas with which they come to the office or is there some way in which the office can change uh, how they operate? I mean, I remember that a study by some state where he's essentially looking at the sort of composition of judicial panels. And if I remember correctly, what he was saying was that when you have a more mixed Republican-Democrat kind of panel, you actually do tend to get more mobility in the kinds of things that people decide. But I suppose the, the other, and, and therefore that actually there is some 
possibility for people to kind of change their minds and shift around under the kind of pressure of being in the office. Whereas I suppose the other view is simply that people put into plan, put it put into uh, practice whatever they come and come to the office with. I guess that's to some extent a question about yours. I, I do think that when judges, uh, when, when lawyers become judges, I, I think for the most part something does change. And that's why I had this uh, qualification in my description of that horsewitch puzzle that uh, I can't think one, I don't think one can uh, extrapolate from too quickly from a comment that horsewitch made as a push administration lawyer to what he'll be like as a judge. Because something does happen to judges. And unless one thinks that uh, judges are professional uh, deceivers, might, might be a respectable view, if you speak to any judge, you will find that uh, he or she will tell you that when you're in, when, when you're in office as a judge, you do feel something like what I call the compulsion of legality. That, that is to decide in such a way that uh, your conclusion will be fully supported by uh, the legal reasons, even if you happen to disagree with your fellow judges about uh, what uh, those legal reasons are. So I, I don't think judges from the inside perceive themselves as uh, deciding in accordance with their political preferences. I think they take very seriously the idea that they're judges, and that's why I take seriously what uh, Gorsuch said in his tribute uh, to Antonin uh, Scalia. I do think that if one takes a, uh, kind of, if one does a kind of sociological analysis of the sort that uh, you rightly recalled Sunstein doing, one gets kind of interesting results. So as I recall the same analysis, the idea is that if you have uh, five Republicans on a bench and one Democrat, you're not going to find any change in the way that the Republican judges decide. But uh, if you have uh, three Republicans and two Democrats, then you will find that uh, matters uh, changing, and that's just, uh, the, that's just an effect that we are all familiar with from our ordinary surroundings, that the uh, more people you have in the room that uh, disagree with you, and yet you have to decide uh, with them in some sense, unless you're going to dissent, you're going to find that your uh, views uh, do uh, change. And, and so I, I, I do think that, this, that the office is bigger than the judge, as, uh, as uh, President Obama has mainly thought. Uh, it was also true of the Office of President when it came to uh, President Trump. Any last questions? When looking at like in the past, of, like how idea ideologies have like become like the movement for litigation and for the rule of law, it's always been in some form of real writing and stuff like that. Now we're seeing with President Trump his policy making and policy idea of thinking going down the live on Twitter. So I was wondering how you see like social media and stuff like that will play a role in the future of the litigation of this of these executive actions and how will the courts respond to them. I don't know, so as you as I said at the beginning of my uh, lecture, this is my second PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> this generally tells you something about my familiarity. Uh, with uh, the, the new world of the, <laughs> of the internet, etc. I, 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 I do think there's something interesting happening when uh, judges uh, will uh, admit as part of uh, the basis of what they're going to make their uh, decision on uh, a president's campaign uh, statements and perhaps uh, uh, his tweets. If one wants to understand what these orders are about, one has to look at what the president is saying because when he speaks either on the campaign trail or in his uh, tweets, he does seem to be saying that what he wants to do is uh, keep the Muslims out. And how are we going to understand this order unless it's about keeping Muslims out? And that makes it, uh, while it might appear facially neutral, in substance discriminatory. Now, if one looks at some of the lower court uh, decisions and looks at the dissenting opinions, for example, uh, uh, Judge Bybee's uh, dissent, uh, from which I gave you uh, some uh, excerpts, in part which I didn't excerpt, uh, he, he said that uh, what, what uh, President Trump has to say on the campaign trail or otherwise is completely irrelevant to a judge who's deciding whether his uh, 
uh, President Trump's order is constitutional or not. What, what one does is one looks at the order on its face, and that's the test for American courts. And I think that tradition has been uh, the test. So the courts are now facing up to this uh, new world. How they will face up to it, I don't know. We've seen some evidence of that in the way that uh, the courts decided in respect of those first uh, two orders. So can I ask one final question, which is really about the rule of law as such? I mean, you may, I'm sure you're aware that uh, E.P. Thompson did a famous de uh, defense of the uh, rule of law and got a lot of trouble from other left-wing historians. Uh, but on the basis that, uh, of really, I think, a very sort of relativist view of the rule of law, I mean, so that, so there, it seems to me that it's this kind of leftist critique, which I actually found rather worrying, often based on Schmidt, which essentially says the law is just all about power, right? The, the law is all about power, so the rule of law is a sort of bogus thing in some, some, some way, and really it's all who's got power in their hands. So what would you say to somebody who put forward a kind of view like that? Why, why is the rule of law? I mean, it's part of the public to be saying uh, all evening, but why the rule of law is important to defend? Well, uh, let, let me try to answer your question by uh, trying to recall exactly what my maligned uh, former supervisor, uh, John Phyllis, had to say about the subject. Phyllis said that uh, in response to a kind of standard critique of the rule of law, that so one can have the rule of law uh, with, uh, even when one has a tyrant ruling. Phyllis said, well, why would a tyrant ever want to subject what he does to the rule of law? Because if you subject what you do, uh, your policies, to the discipline of the rule of law, then they have to be filtered through the legal order. You have to pass a general statute. That statute has to be interpreted by judges, implemented by officials. And it introduces a huge amount of complexity into your attempt to rule by uh, fiat that you don't really want if you just want power. And, and, and that, I think, is the answer, is that if all one's after is power, then one wouldn't, one, one wouldn't rule by law, one would rule by some uh, other means. Yeah, well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for that. <laughs>